So tonight, um, I decided to continue in a similar pattern. This is, this is kind of a standalone week since next week we'll be over in Worship Center for Rejoice and then there are a couple of other Wednesdays in May where we'll do some different things. But tonight I thought I would take a look at another one of the stories that comes to us in this season of Easter. So the weeks that fall between Easter and Pentecost. Um, the Revised Common Lectionary, which is a three-year cycle of readings that lots of churches use. Uh, we don't use it every week, all the time, but we do refer back to it uh, quite often. The lectionary takes us to passages that, um, that tell us about the risen Christ and bear witness to the evidence of the risen Christ. So if you were with us on Sunday in worship, um, you heard me tell the story of the appearance that Jesus makes on the beach to several of the disciples and specifically to Peter in the conversation that they had. Um, tonight we're going to look at the story that comes from the book of Acts about uh, an appearance that comes to Saul, or who we often think of as Paul. <coughs> and his is a little bit different, right? Because Saul was not alive at the time of Jesus, or he was not really, he was not one of the disciples who was present with Jesus at the time of Jesus' ministry and death and resurrection. So, um, so he did not have the same kind of appearance uh, or in bodily form that the disciples had and that the Gospels tell us about. And yet Paul has a very powerful encounter with the risen Christ that it was told to us in the ninth chapter of Acts. Paul's conversion story actually is referenced three different places in the book of Acts, which that alone tells us a pretty significant story uh, because it's the only thing that uh, Luke, who tends to be a very precise and concise writer, tells us three different times. And then Paul also speaks about it himself when he is writing his first letter to the Corinthians. And when he talks about it there, he, he says, you know, that yes, Jesus appeared to me, even though I was one, and the English translation is often, who was untimely born. So it's kind of like Paul saying, even though I didn't get to be around when he was making those other appearances to the disciples right after his resurrection, he showed up to me in a very real way. And so the ninth chapter of Acts is where we get the fullest version of that encounter. So we're going to walk through the story tonight because there's a lot in it. Um, and the story really is the message. But I'll stop along the way and, and share some things and elaborate as we go. Before I do that, um, and if you want, you can follow along and find the whole scripture printed in your bulletin. Um, but before I do that, let's pray. Come Holy Spirit and breathe life into my words on this evening that they might carry a word from you into our hearts and lives. Amen. So the beginning of the ninth chapter of Acts, the story about the encounter starts this way. Meanwhile, Saul was still spewing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest seeking letters to the synagogues in Damascus. If he found persons who belonged to the way, whether men or women, these letters would authorize him to take them as prisoners back to Jerusalem. So, at the beginning of this story, we hear about a man named Saul who has shown up a couple of times already in the book of Acts. And both times, it is clear, it is made clear that this is a man who is persecuting followers of Jesus. Now, Saul thinks he is doing the right thing. He thinks he is acting as he is supposed to as a part of the religious establishment, as a part of the people who were seeking to follow the law and the Torah as best as they possibly could. So he thinks that what he is doing is good and right and justified. But it is scary times for persons who are following Christ, or who, as the passage just referenced, were part of the way. 
that was the earliest terminology that scholars uh, sense that was used to talk about who we now refer to as Christians or followers of Christ. They were referred to as people who were of the way. And so anybody who was of the way and who at that time would have still been connected to a synagogue or to the temple was considered a, a false believer or someone who was a heretic, if you will, someone who needed to be dealt with. And so Saul has requested from the high priest in Jerusalem that he not only be able to take care of anybody who is practicing wrongly right here in Jerusalem, but now to go out to other communities and to address this issue in other places as well. So, so he wants to go to Damascus to round up all of these people and to cleanse the synagogues, to purge them of any wrong belief or practice. But God has something different in mind for Saul. Verse 3 begins, During the journey, as he approached Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven encircled him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice asking him, Saul, Saul, why are you harassing me? Now, I'm going to encourage you to make a note to self. Anytime, uh, if God ever speaks your name twice in succession, you might want to do one of two things. Either listen really closely and be ready to follow whatever it is he, God says, or run quickly as far and as fast as you possibly can. Because this is a repetition that has happened several times before in the scriptures. So in Genesis, God says, Abraham, Abraham, Right before he asked him to make a trip to a mountaintop with his son, which Abraham thinks is going to require him to sacrifice his only son. And then later in Genesis, we hear God say, Jacob, Jacob, right before he commands him to move his family to Egypt, to a foreign land, where they can find food and be taken care of in a season of famine. And then we hear God say, Moses, Moses, from a burning bush, when he is about to call Moses into action and to send him back into Egypt to deliver the people. So just saying, if God, if you hear God saying your name twice in succession, something big is probably about to happen. So on this particular occasion, on the road to Damascus, it's Saul. Saul. And there is this light, Scripture tells us. And then, and then Saul speaks up. Saul asks, who are you, Lord? And that is very interesting. That immediately, Saul, whoever it is that is speaking to him, he hears as an authoritative voice and one to whom he refers as Lord. And he could not have possibly imagined or expected what came back in response. Because when he asks the question, who are you? The answer that comes back is, I am Jesus. Now remember that Saul has been spending his time convinced that this Jesus guy was a fraud, a fake, and that the folks who are following him are headed in the wrong direction and need to be dealt with. And now when Saul asks who this authoritative voice is that is speaking to him, the voice says, I am Jesus, whom you are harassing, came to reply. Now get up and enter the city. And you will be told what you must do. So here is Saul, who we learn from some of his writings in the New Testament in the letters that he wrote to various communities of faith. We know that Saul was an overachiever. He was the kind of guy who was always first in the class, 
rose to the top, always did everything he was supposed to do, excelled. And so he has been zealous in seeking to fulfill what he thinks is his obligation to cleanse the religious establishment and to do what he thinks is right. And he is active and I'm sure kind of a type A guy who is always on the go. And in this moment, the voice that calls out to him tells him that at least for the immediate future, he's just going to have to wait and do nothing. And so as the story continues, we hear that those traveling with him stood there speechless and they heard the voice, but they saw no one. After they picked Saul up from the ground, he opened his eyes, but he couldn't see. And so they led him by the hand into Damascus. Those traveling with him stood there speechless. They heard the voice, but they saw no one. Have you ever been a witness to a conversion experience? You know, when a conversion experience happens, it happens in a personal way, typically. And sometimes for the other people around that person who is having the experience, it can be confusing, it can be awkward, it can be uncomfortable, it can feel strange. So all of these people around Saul who have, who have traveled with him expecting him to do one thing when he gets to Damascus, are now hearing this voice speak to Saul and have to be wondering what in the world is going on. Meanwhile, the encounter has totally rocked Saul's world. And he must be thinking, what in the world is happening to me? For three days, he was blind. And he neither ate nor drank anything. And then the story shifts. It leaves us with Saul having had this experience on the road. And then the story shifts. It's kind of like when you're, when you, when you're watching a movie or when you're reading a book. And sometimes there, there are two parallel stories going. And so it, it, it tells you a part of one person's story for a little while, and then it shifts and it tells you about another person's story for a little while. That's kind of what happens here in the ninth chapter of Acts. So we've been hearing about Saul for a little while, and he's in one place. And then all of a sudden, the story shifts, and the camera moves to another scene. And it tells us that in Damascus, there was a certain disciple named Ananias. And the Lord spoke to him in a vision, Ananias. And he answered, yes, Lord, and notice that Ananias also responds as if this voice is one that has authority. The Lord instructed him, go to Judah's house on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias enter and put his hands on him to restore his sight. And Ananias countered, Lord, I have heard many reports about this man. People say he has done horrible things to your holy people in Jerusalem. He is here with authority from the chief priests to arrest everyone who calls on your name. Ananias has heard about Saul. He knows who Saul is, and he even knows word has gotten to Damascus that he is headed there and what he plans to do in rounding up the people of the way. The Lord replied, Go. The Lord doesn't argue with Ananias. He simply reiterates the command. Go. And then he gives the reason why. This man is the agent I have chosen to carry my name before Gentiles, kings, and Israelites. Now that must have shocked Ananias, right? That this person who has been perhaps the most vocal and most vehement 
persecutor of people of the way is now going to be the ambassador of the way. And yet, Ananias has such a relationship with the voice, with the Lord, that he trusts the voice. And so in the next verse, we hear that Ananias went to the house and he placed his hands on Saul. Now, now think about that for a minute. <laughs> think about Ananias walking into that space, knowing what Saul has done, knowing that Saul was the one who stood by and held on to people's cloaks as they were stoning Stephen in Jerusalem and cheering them on in what they were doing, knowing what Saul was coming to Damascus to do. What courage, in spite of the voice that he heard telling him to go, what courage it must have taken for Ananias to enter that room, let alone to put a hand on this man who has caused so much harm and so much pain. And then when he does, the way that he addresses him, Brother Saul, the Lord sent me. The one who had been an enemy in Christ has become a brother. Paul later talks about this in his writings, right? That there is this ministry of reconciliation that God has accomplished through Christ and that that ministry has been handed down to us, he says, so that God might be at work in us, reconciling. Brother Saul, the Lord sent me. Jesus, who appeared to you on the way as you were coming here, he sent me so that you could see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. I once was blind, but now I see. And instantly, flakes fell from Saul's eyes. Some translations say things like scales came off of his eyes, and he could see again. And then what happens next? He got up and was baptized. Because baptism is a sign of the dying of an old way of life and the rising up of a new way of life. His experience on the road to Damascus prompted a total change in his way of being, a totally new way of life and new way of seeing his place in life. And after eating, he regained his strength, it tells us. He stayed with the disciples in Damascus for several days. And right away, he began to preach about Jesus in the synagogues. He is God's son, he declared. Imagine being in the congregation the first time Saul stood up and said to people of the way, Jesus, what you all have been saying all along, you, you were right. He is God's son. Everyone who heard it was baffled. No surprise there, right? They questioned each other. Isn't he the one who was wreaking havoc among those in Jerusalem who called on this name? Hadn't he come here to take those same people as prisoners to the chief priests? You know, in this story of Saul's conversion, we really hear the story of two powerful transformational experiences. Those two parallel stories of both Saul and Ananias. We often forget just how significant of an event had to happen within Ananias' heart and head to be able to do what he did in the story as well. And in 
putting those two stories beside each other in this, in this conversion experience, what we see on display is the power of the Holy Spirit to do a work of transformation in persons both within and outside the church. Transformation continues to happen for those of us who are already within the church. And transformation happens in wonderful and powerful ways for persons who are beyond the church. It's important to note the location of this particular story within the book of Acts. Because it helps tell us what is going on in this whole section of, of Luke's narrative. It is right in the middle of several other stories of conversion. So just before this story, we have heard about Philip encountering some Samaritans who receive the good news and want to be converted to the way. And then right after he has left them, he is traveling and he comes upon an Ethiopian eunuch who, according to the old way, would not have been welcome in the synagogue or in the temple. No matter how much he professed belief, would not have been accepted as a member of the community. But he has read scriptures and he wants to understand them. And then Philip comes along at just the right moment and he's able to ask him, what must I do to be baptized? And Philip recognizes the Holy Spirit at work in that moment. And the eunuch receives the good news of the gospel. And from there, the camera shifts to the story of Saul on the road to Damascus. And then it takes us back to Jerusalem again, where we hear about Peter having a dream and being told that what he once thought was unclean should not be considered unclean and that he should, in fact, go and visit a man named Cornelius, a Gentile who wants to know more about the good news. And Peter responds and goes. What we hear through this whole section of Acts is the evidence of God doing a new thing. God doing a new thing in order to invite new, more people into the good news of the gospel and the life that as for them. So my question to leave you with tonight is this. What new thing do you think God is going to do right now? What new thing is God wanting to do in your life, your own part of life? What new thing might God be wanting to do in this community of faith that we call Trinity? What new thing might God be wanting to do in Gainesville that we might be a part of? What new thing is God wanting to do in a world where people are hungry for community and connection and where people have a spiritual hunger but aren't quite sure where to get it filled? What new thing is God wanting to do? And how will we, the church, be a part of sharing good news? The story of Acts, of course, is the unfolding story of the church becoming the church. And it's a story that is still ongoing and that we are a part of. May we pay attention. May we listen. And if we hear our name called twice, may we really pay attention and be ready to respond. <laughs> and may we be faithful. Let's pray. Oh God, we could never possibly have you all figured out. And your ways of 
of wanting to be in relationship with your children. And so we pray for attentive ears and wide open eyes and hearts and a readiness to go when you say to us, go. And God, we also ask for for you to, to put whatever it is that you want to put on each of our hearts in a way that we can be clear and can know where it is that you want us to move next in our lives and in our relationship with you. We pray these all these things, Father.